there's a guy peeing out the window onto the crowd. And it was just freaking, I was, I, it was just amazing. I was like, what? Doug Carrion played bass in punk bands The Descendants, Doggy Style, Dag Nasty, and The Humble Gods. For Love Not Lisa, and recently Field Day. Andy Chernoff is a founding member of New York punk band The Dictators, The Resistance with Joey Ramone, The Master Plan, and Manitoba's Wild Kingdom. He performed on Joey Ramone's posthumously released first record titled Don't Worry About Me. I'm going to jump totally in a segment. Sorry? And the second posthumous record. Oh, cool. Didn't know that. What was that called? Uh, That was called uh, And You. Neat. Uh, No, 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 no. Oh, you know, you know. You know, okay. That's what Jordan Moon said, you know, like he said, you You know, know. man, man. I think that's an (laughs) East and West Coast thing, isn't it? (laughs) You know, man. He abused it totally. So I want to jump right into something that I think Doug's (laughs) going to think is, I I know he's going to, but so... Uh, reading up on you, you did the Teenage Wasteland Gazette, which looked very cool. But then you wrote briefly for Cream, and I read that you got to interview Muddy Waters. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. and I saw some of the other names. I saw Alice Cooper and stuff, but Muddy Waters to me stood out for whatever reason. How old were you when you interviewed Muddy Waters, and how did it go? What did you say to this guy? Okay, I did that for We Magazine. We okay. Magazine, OUI, was a, a spinoff of Playboy. And uh, I was friends with Nick Tashi's, the writer Nick Tashi's, who died a year or two ago. Uh, and he um, he sort of uh, was a mentor of mine. And he uh, I wanted to be a rock writer. And he he got me hey, I'll, here. You interview Buddy Waters, you know, and um, just to ask a bunch of stupid questions. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Did okay. you succeed? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I pretty much succeeded. I was probably 19, 20 years old at the time. And I had. You know, now Muddy Waters is a god to me. At the time, you know, I knew Rolling Stones lead to Muddy Waters, but I was not, he wasn't the god he is now. And I wish I was, uh, you know, I savored the moment a little bit more. Was that a formal interview? Like you did at a hotel or backstage or how'd that come about? Yeah, at his hotel, the Hotel Edison in, uh, in Times Square in New York City. Yeah. Wow. It's That's so pretty- wow. That's pretty, yeah. that's pretty, yeah. uh, and, and yeah. I was, I was, it was like, Oh, I'm, I'm just doing this interview, you know? And yeah. Now what, I was think, he, wow. was I he was, a nice guy, like a warm and fuzzy guy or like a, like a grumpy guy? No, he's very pleasant. He was sitting on the, on the, on the, on the bed and the thing is he had, had his, uh, you know, his tea that what we call Guinea teas. In New York right. City. <laughs> right. Wife I remember beater. Correctly. They call them wife beaters on the West coast. Yeah. Wife beater. At that time. I was supposed to, I did this podcast with these young ladies, very nice young ladies. Uh, they're called the muses podcast and they're feminist groupies. So I was like, okay, I'm in. And so I said, wife beater. I'm like, this is probably the worst podcast to say wife beaters on. And she's like, yes. yeah, we're trying to change the terminology, but we all do know what you're talking about. I was like, Oof, you know, brilliant. <laughs> yeah, you played in a wife beater for years on stage. I did. I don't I think did. I ever saw you wear anything else. I'm a, I'm a uniform well, you had pants kind on. of guy. I am a <laughs> uniform kind of guy. I usually choose a uniform. Yeah. <laughs> so what was the dumbest thing you asked Maddie Waters? Do you remember? Uh, We're gonna, I'm picking on you. This is good though. <laughs> well, I don't remember. I you know this is a lump. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a senior citizen, and my memory's. <laughs> I don't right. remember. Good. It good. was uh, you know we're talking about almost 50 years ago. I don't quite right. remember. Uh, That's just pretty rad. Right. Totally a bunch right. of really stupid questions, and 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 um, I feel like uh, you know, but you know when you're young. You're, you're foolish. <laughs> here, I got a dumb question. I got one dumb here for you. Would you say Dick Manitoba is really handsome or is that just for marketing purposes? That's oh, my- I gave him that name because uh, uh, his real name is Richie Blum. Yeah. And I said, and there's a wrestler called Handsome Jimmy Valiant. So I said, I'm going to call you Handsome Dick Manitoba. And I gave, so I gave him that name because I didn't think Richie Blum was a, was a good enough uh, <laughs> Nice. I only changed my name. I have, I, I, I kept my ethnic name right. rather than giving myself a cool name, but right. So when you guys met initially, so you were into wrestling as well. Oh yeah. I love wrestling. I don't, I don't like it anymore, but at the time I loved it. I found it so entertaining. Yeah. What about you, Doug? Were you into uh, Andre the giant and stuff? 
I, I'm going to go with, uh, I, I'm, I might've been a kid that put up the wrestling posters on my wall. Only I'd never watched wrestling, but I really did like the, um, uh, I guess the showmanship, the shock value. So back in the dinosaur day, they used to have like, you know, like, uh, I don't know, the same thing as team beat or something like that, but it was like wrestling magazines. Um, and I remember always having like that and wondering where all the, like, I was so young, I would have thought the blood was real. You know, where the you know they'd have like the blood running down their faces and stuff like that. Yeah, and then sometimes my it was real. Sometimes it was real. They they take razor blades, they cut their their forehead. And you yeah, see these wrestlers and they have all these scars there. But my favorite part of wrestling wasn't the wrestling. My favorite part was the interview between sure. the matches when these guys were just bloviating and ego. <laughs> it was really really funny. When I was when I was a kid, I went to go visit. My dad was working for. Um, I can't remember one of the airlines and he was in based in San Juan in Puerto Rico. And I went down to go visit him for a summer vacation, stupid wrestling story. And as I was watching wrestling, cause they had it like on Spanish TV there and I'm watching, watching, watching. And he says to me, he's like, Hey dude, that guy lives in my building. I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah, go downstairs. And I go down the thing. I knock on the door. I can't remember who the wrestler was. I open the door and it was the same dude. And it were, there were like three gigantic, massive, just mountains and they were all watching the wrestling show at the same time. It was so <laughs> badass, like watching, like watching the highlight reels or something. Did it's they have cool. pizza? You got to have pizza. It, I, I don't remember if it was pizza, but it was definitely like casual, like super casual. Just they were just watching the show. Just like, oh shit, we're watching the show. Fun, neat stuff. You don't uh, remember the name of the guy? But it, no, no, no. But it would have been. It probably would have been like one of the more like latin guys that came up from mexico city or something like that sorry my phone's getting a little wacky here no you're cool we lose you i think we lost him there yeah uh, he'll jump back on all right i'll He's carry just... it yeah okay <laughs> so uh i was gonna ask let's do one that's just you uh how did you guys pick california son why did you pick that song oh we just love the song it was you know uh, it was just, uh, I thought it was a great song. Uh, it was me and me and Scott Kempner probably chose it. Who was the other guitar player. And of course we recorded that, uh, a year before the Ramones, the Ramones saw us doing it, you know, when they yeah. did it, but, uh, yeah, so uh, that's one. So my friend asked me to ask you his name, Darren Pouchowitz. And, uh, he, he had a couple, he writes for the Jewish journal amongst other stuff. And so he wanted me to ask you as far there was a lot of Jews here in the, all you guys in the, in the, uh, in the group were Jewish. Uh, was there a connection because you were Jewish in any level or it, it did it just go that way or. Uh, you know, and he mentioned like Mark Mendoza being Jewish, Chris Stein, yes. from Blondie. And yes. there's just a huge punk Jewish community. Well, I think, um, I'm just going to speculate here. You know, New York City has a lot of Jews. We're growing up a lot of Eastern European Jews <clears throat> who uh, emigrated. Uh, my grandfather immigrated in the early 1900s. He was escaping the czar in Russia. Uh, and there was a, there is a uh, reverence for art in, in the Jewish community and education. And I think uh, my parents, you know, hey, we went to, we saw the New York Philharmonic. They would take me to museums. They would, uh, you know, they wouldn't let me watch regular television when I was a kid. That uh, They would they have a limit on it. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was a reference for, for the arts. And, um, of course, they didn't think rock and roll was the right thing to go into. But I think it's a combination. Just a lot of Jews in New York. Yeah. And, and a general reverence for for and respect for the arts. It's interesting. So, if me growing up, my dad's entire record collection was Cantor records, Cantor singing, like everything. Oh, oh. Okay, you're Jewish, huh? I'm Jewish. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where where, where, where are you from? Initially England, uh, but I was raised in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So I was born in Cambridge, but my mother and father were uh, Northern London, Hampstead Heath, wow. very Jewish community. So. Were they religious Jews? You know, it depends. So here, like people, they have different ideas of religion these days. So we always did Friday night services at, at home, though. We do the Friday night prayers at home, but it was a shorter version of. And then, um, oh, there was no ham in the house. 
but uh you know we were out so so sort of sort of so a lot of people now they're like wow that's really religious but it's not that much it's not that religious so uh, yeah it's not my, my grandfather was religious my father was not religious though we didn't have a hammer bacon i don't know why maybe just uh you know we didn't really you catholic right doug yeah but my mom is in a similar thing um andy <laughs> my um my background's italian and my grandparents came over same kind of thing uh ellis island uh i'm assuming that's where your grandfather came in yeah. and you can correct me but i'm yeah. pretty darn sure uh and so you figure for my grandparents that would be like the 20s and then they uh moved to new york but my mom as she was coming up the ranks was pushing similar to your dad, Andy, pushing away from religiosity. And so she was more of a beatnik, uh, Greenwich Village beatnik early, you know, early 50s, that kind of thing. So so I grew up on the other side of that, like not religious side, but but the actual pushing away from that, my mom's version of that. You know, Greenwich Village was was an Italian neighborhood in the 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. And, and um you know, so a lot of the Italians there became beatniks. I mean, um, just a side note. No, yeah, no, nice. it's it, it's a it, it's 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 funny, Andy. As I was doing a little bit of a little bit of reading on you, um, I I was born in Queens at Forest Hills Hospital. So, oh, Forest Hills, yeah, which is, is kind of rock central, you know. I which is kind of rad. It's kind of rad. <laughs> like usually. Go ahead. Go usually, ahead. usually when I do when I do interviews, people will ask me, so where are you from? I go, I'm Doug Carrion from Hermosa Beach, California. And they go, well, where'd you, where'd you, where were you born? I go, I was born in, I, I grew up in Hermosa Beach, California, the home of the mighty black flag. But I was born in Queens, New York, you know, the home of the, the mighty Ramones. And so that's usually kind of some funky way of how I explain my uh, bi-coastal kind of upbringing. Well, Forest Hills High School, uh, Leslie West went there. Uh, Randy California from Spirit. Uh, um, uh, what's his name? Wadi Wachtel went there. Oh. Uh, uh, Ramones. Yeah. Uh, Smith from Television. And I went to a neighboring high school, Flushing High School. Mm -hmm. And uh, also uh, neighboring from that in this five mile area, the other neighboring high school was Newtown High School. That's where Johnny Thunders went. That's where uh, Gene Simmons went. This right. is, you know, um, so it was really the core of the uh, that small area of New York City was the core of the New York rock and roll scene and yeah. mostly Jewish. You know, not all. Jewish, yeah, that's you know, that, you know. the, the, the Jewish and the Italian thing is pretty like of course you just go just f do the math but what's amazing is that's when public schools were actually pretty cool like they were they're kind of decent back then now yeah. public schools are a total mess yeah yeah I, yeah i went to a school around the corner from my house now people friends of mine who had, i don't live in new york city anymore but friends were like i gotta take get on the subway and i'll take my kid into manhattan to take the school <laughs> and right. it's a whole process of getting your your kid to school as opposed to just the neighborhood Right. When I was a, when I was a young kid, like four, you know, when my mom was living in Greenwich village, before I moved to Hermosa beach, both my older brother and older sister went to PS 41. So oh, I kind yeah. of, I, I was too young. I was a, a dinky kid, but uh, yeah, like I, I would go on the campus and pick them up and drop them off and so forth. So I kind of, am very familiar with the, that, the old days of the, like the PS systems, PS 41. That's where they went. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. 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 Did you ever play CBGB, uh, Doug? Several times. So my friend said, uh, I don't think I ever went in there. And I'm not sure, but I don't think I did. But it was a friggin' dump. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that how you remember? I mean, why did you want to spend so much time in this place, Andy? Um, because it was the only place that we could play. <laughs> was sure. it really? You got to understand, in the 70s in New York City and the, the New York area, if you played original songs, you couldn't get booked. If you played cover songs, you had dozens and dozens of bars you could play in. So uh, uh, there was this bar we used to play before uh, uh, CBG was a bar called the Coventry, which was mostly a glam rock bar. Uh, and there was a whole glam rock scene in New York. We played there. And then CBGB's opened, and we got to play there. And the great thing about CBGB's is you played 
Thursday, Friday, Saturday, two sets a night. So you're playing six shows. That's like, yeah, you know, that's like a, a, a half a year's worth of shows before. Sure. before. So, uh, and, and, and then Max was Kansas City, which originally was booking uh, album acts and touring acts, started booking local acts, and a few other things, though. But CBGB's was just the place to play, you know? It was, you yeah. know, it was great. It had a great sound system, you know, a good stage. Yeah, I, I went in, I, I, I went in kind of like maybe on the next wave of punk rock. So the first time I would have done CBGB's would have been probably about 10 years after you. So I'm assuming you were playing CBGB's in 75. Is that about right? No, we didn't play there until a little later. Our record came out 75. We kind of broke okay. up while because we got dropped. It was like, oh, right. well, you know, you know what, what are we doing? And then all of a sudden there's a scene in New York. Right. We had a place to play. So yeah. it was... Uh, and uh, and so the the first time I went to CBGB's would have been with the Descendants in 1985 in the summer. And hmm. this was back when that area was all blown out buildings. It was just Bowery bums and crazy right. people. And I remember... Uh, I remember pulling up to the venue in our beat up van, uh, like a 71 Econo line and we're pulling up and out of the window, because remember they had that, I guess it was the paradise hotel or whatever that bum hotel was. that was next door. Palace. The, the palace. Uh, thank you. Um, there's a guy peeing out the window onto the crowd and it was just freaking, I was, I, it was just amazing. I was like, what is New York's on? finest freaking, <laughs> But that was that was back in the day where, you know, there were still cars on blocks and, and stuff in in the in the city. So super common, like incredibly sketchy. And then probably about 10 years after that, I, I would have gone back through there with my wife in the mid 90s. And I was doing shows. And as I walked around that area, it had all become kind of like high end real estate. It's oh. pretty it's pretty wild. <laughs> How much it changed. Now, high end real. Yes. Fancy yeah. restaurants. You know, expensive lofts, fancy yeah. hotels. It's a yeah, completely trippy, different. totally trippy. Like, you know, and, and I probably went through there. I think I might have played through there maybe four or five times. You know, four or five times. Uh, but that was during those like CBGB's matinees. Like, I did a lot of those CBGB's matinees, and and on sometimes Sundays? on yes, Sunday? yeah, yes. And sometimes we would do a double header where we'd play the CBGB show and then we'd try to go to New Jersey to play a night show. And those were always pretty um, trying to move giant base cabinets through the crowd to get <laughs> just what a freaking yeah. mess. But that was like in the day of, um, I guess, Tommy Victor was the sound guy, like before prong and all yeah. that stuff. So, yeah. yeah. So kind of cool. But yep, I went through there. One of the first times I went through there, I remember playing a show. And it's great. Everybody's there. The kids are jumping and doing flips and I can see the light, you know, cause the door was in the back. So you're standing on the stage and you can right. kind of see it was still daytime cause it's freaking matinee right. and a kid jumped up on stage and wrapped his leg around my cable, my bit, my cable. And he jumps out. And I remember looking out and seeing the silhouette of all of the electronics from my base, just going across the crowd. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, oh no. Yeah. And so that's like funny CVGVs, like seeing the silhouette of this kid stage, you know, jumping off the stage with all my freaking EMGs, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Those, those, was fun. Those, those Sunday hardcore shows was, it was a birth of hardcore in New York. And they, those mm. were some exciting, exciting shows. So I went to a few of them. You know, I wasn't uh, involved in the scene. Mm -hmm. at, but uh, I saw it was they were always packed with young young kids mm -hmm. and a lot of so much energy you know mm -hmm. it was it was a, it was a great little scene there. Yeah, I was you know Descendants was was something that was a little bit more like um, maybe the maybe like the Beach Boys on steroids like that like kind of pop and melodic but blistering fast lightning fast and I was always uh, kind of fascinated that the super hard, like New York freaking a seven crowd would come out to see this silly punk pop band, you know, because as we'd be blistering through songs, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they were, they were in incredibly welcoming, like super, super nice to us mm -hmm. as we were just like literally beach kids, like, yeah. Hey, we're, like yeah. we're in New York, you know, watching when the, did the, the uh, Sort of break through and become really popular. What, what, what album was the, uh, uh, 
I'm going to say that there's kind of like, they've had a long legacy. It looks like the Yankees and, and I'm part of the alumni. So I'm in the second wave of the descendants record three, but they kind of, I think the Milo goes to college one in 82 was the huge one. And then the one that they, when they came back that I wasn't involved with, uh, I want to say it was in 95 and it was the everything sucks record. And that one really like, I yeah. think, you know, for if memory serves me where Milo goes to college might've sold 2000 units. And that was considered great at the time. I think everything sucks was like 250,000 records or something like considerably better. <laughs> they're, they're a major, major draw right now live. Oh, they're, f- <laughs> and it, I'm in fact, I'm getting ready to play. I'm still friends with them. Like I still, I'm super friends with them. I talk to them and uh, they're getting ready to play punk rock bowling on, um, 924 on September 24th. And I'll, I'll go before and, and, you know, they're going to come see, I'm playing punk rock bowling on 925 and they'll come out and hang out. So we're still like, I grew up at the beach and the beach is just this teeny community. And a lot of the people just remain friends and you just, you still run into them all the time at these shows or it is what it is. So they're they're I'm happy to say like, we still have a great relationship, like great fun, spastic, Whenever, whenever I'm in town, they'll come hang. Whenever they're in town, we hang. So it's good. It's a really cool thing. Forever, like three decades later. <laughs> great. Yeah, that's great. No, I've, I, I've had a lot of relationships in music that have lasted that long, and I, and I really, I really treasure them. Yeah, so, because you end up. What happens is you go through. It's kind of like maybe going through. I don't know. Just a lot of bumps and on the road, you know, sometimes good days, sometimes challenging days, and you build a very serious bond. Uh, usually not all the time. Sometimes there's tension, but usually you, you build a lot of, a lot of bonds because you're spending hours and hours and hours in, in a van or on a train or whatever on a plane with the same fricking knuckleheads. <laughs> so you kind of, you know, they're like extended brothers in a way. Absolutely. I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. So what's it like now? Cause both of you are doing new material uh, in the last year or so with guys that you have known for mm-hmm. shoot the better part of your lives. I think, mm-hmm. you know, like longevity, long time or decades for real. So what's the right writing songs with those guys again? And you're, you know, you're recapturing your youth, but you're bringing in new material. It's gotta be kind of fun to be like, dude, we're still doing this, bro. (laughs) Look at us. (laughs) Well, Andy, I'll let you go first. You can answer that one. I'll go second. Um, you know, uh, you know, reforming the dictators was literally the last thing on my mind, but we, we had some legal things we, we had to deal with. And that brought me, Ross and Scott together and it lasted over a year. And so we were, in, we were, in, and I had, I had kind of lost communication with, with Ross. I was always friends with Scott, but it brought us back together, communicating on a, mm-hmm. on a regular basis about how do we get, get to this money that we rode. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, at the end of that, Ross says, Hey, Let's reform the original band, me, Ross, and you, me, Ross, and Scott. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, I don't know, man. I got, I got a nice <laughs> life here. I don't want to, like, you know, upset the cow, <laughs> right? The, the car. But Scott, Scott was into it. Scott was mm-hmm. said, "Hey, let's do it. Come on, we can have fun." And this is at the end of 2019, mm-hmm. <laughs> right before. And I said, "Hey, okay, let's 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 after Thanksgiving and Christmas." In January 2020, let's start talking about it. And of course, the pandemic, that's when the right. pandemic was just starting. And I am so thankful that we did it because it kept me busy during right. the pandemic. So, you know, just, just working on the songs, trading files, you know, uh, figuring out what we got to do. So um, I forgot the question, but I well, I, well, what's it like guess, working with these guys that you've known for oh, decades? Well, yeah, it was great. It's great. And we got, for drums, we brought in Albert Bouchard, who was in the Blue Oyster Cult. He's, he played, he's, he, yep. he's a cabal player on, uh, on Don't Fear the Reaper. Sure. And he, he's, a, he's a buddy. We've all worked with him. And he's just Didn't great. he produce the fir- one of the f- first records for you guys like a gazillion years ago? No, 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 no. Who Albert, was the Blue Oyster Cult like, connection from way back? We were managed and produced by the, by the same got guys, Steve Perlman and Murder Group. Got it. That's, that's how we met Albert because we were part of the got it 
the same family. Yeah, family, yeah. sure. Yeah. So yeah. Albert's been great. Um, Scott, unfortunately, Scott has been had some health issues. Mm-hmm. So he left. The, he had to leave the band. We have a new guy who we, we're mm-hmm. starting to work in. But uh, uh, it's. Uh, but I'm. I'm. I treasure. I, it's been great. You and, know? and do you think you guys will do? Sh- is it like you're going to do shows, or what's the plan? What's the plan, man? Like, what are you going to do? Well, we put out two songs. We have another uh-huh. song coming out. Uh, hopefully August. I, we'll see what, how it is. It's, it takes longer. Cool. And we, we'll do a video for it. And we, have, we want to do record a little more and, and put out, a, we have a, a, a holiday song about Festivus. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I'm Festivus. We want to keep the spirit going. And that'll get us to uh, 2020, at which point we'll, we'll start talking about shows. We have um, right. uh, two agents who are interested in. Right. One agent I think might be right. You know, yeah. Uh, we got to work the new guy in. Yeah. No, you, it's, a, does everybody live close by? Like, are they close ish to you or everybody spread out across the country? <laughs> I live in upstate New York, two uh, hours, two and a half hours from New York city. A uh, new, new uh, guitar player lives in Jersey. Uh, like great. An hour from New York city. Ross is in Queens. Albert is in part time Manhattan, part time Long Island. So. Good. Uh, That's cool. Either. We're not it, close to each other. That, you know what, what's funny is um, that seems to be a very common theme with bands nowadays where they're pretty spread out. Like, uh, for example, with the field day for Peter and I, Peter lives in Philly. I live in Los Angeles and the band is kind of based here and he flies in and that's kind of our norm. Um, but when you take, let's say a band like, uh, I don't know, like Bad Religion, like those guys don't live in the same city. Everybody's spread across the country. One of them lives in Canada. Like, so it's, it's pretty common now. I, and I, I think that um, in a way there's something kind of amazing about that because when you all get together, you're really focused on the, I guess you could say the positive part of why you're in the same room and you don't get stuck on all the, the BS and minutia. You just get right to it. And, and I think that's kind of cool where you don't, even though you're not part of like, you don't know what the other person's doing in the normal day-to-day life, like you would when you're doing a hundred day tour or something. Now you just go, Oh shit, we're at rehearsal. We're here for two hours. We're going to work on these songs here tonight. And you enjoy, I think maybe you enjoy each other's company a little bit more because the time is so much more limited, but more, maybe more valuable as you get older. I don't know. I, mm. I, I have a, a really, really great relationship with Peter and, um, and learning how to do things during COVID was actually kind of cool for us because from a production standpoint, um, I produce all the music, I produce all the records. He and I write in a certain kind of like MP3 back and forth, blah, blah, blah way. And we've just kind of made it work. But um, we're right now for us, we're just getting ready to get back to shows. So uh, we're right at, we're right a kind of maybe a teeny bit ahead of where you are, where it's like, yeah. we've been releasing music during the down, down time, you know, during the COVID time. So we did a couple things. We did a seven inch that did real well as a German import. We did an EP that did really well as a German import. And now we're right about to get back to shows and, and, and that'll probably take us up through, um, probably up through December of, of uh 2021 like shows but we'll do a okay. bunch of them, punk punk rock you, rolling you, you, you have shows that are booked already several yeah 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 okay. yeah, yeah. What, but what, that's kind the, of, what kind of venues and how big uh um well for people? us for us we do kind of what works for us is like 250 cap rooms 350 cap rooms so i know you probably know less than zero about about myself, but it's like, I kind of came up the ranks learning how to do everything very black flag style where Mm -hmm. you learn how to produce, you learn how to book the band, you learn how to produce, you learn how to do shows, you learn how to do your own tech gear. Uh, and so I'm what you might call a punk rock impresario where I have a, a three decades of experience on the ground, hustling hashtag don't hate the hustle. So um, the last year and change for COVID, um, we've been doing a lot of recordings and now I've jumped right back in. Like I'm the guy that books the band, not very glamorous, but it is exactly what it is. It's like, it's a, I'm the day-to-day guy, the inside guy. And, um, 
yeah, just kind of hustling. But in answer to your question, usually like 250 cap rooms. And I think we have something like. Will they, will they, will they, will those rooms be full of 250 people packed? Yeah. 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 So the, yeah. the so, clubs are not worried about COVID anymore. Is that, that's my question. Nah. So, so that's a beautiful question. And every state is different on how they're going to go about that. Some have different protocols. Um, uh, so I, I would have to say it's going to vary depending on where we go. Um, but we're not going to start doing shows until uh, the first one's going to be in San Pedro on 922. So we still have a couple months for all the BS to go away. And then we'll do somewhere in the neighborhood of like 15 shows before the end of the year. And then we're already booking into 2022. We're going to be in San Diego, blah, 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 all that junk. And then um, we have holds all the way through. Wow. All the way through May of 2022. So we're, 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 we work pretty long range, but yeah. it's cool. That, that's, that's what I do. What's it like. So with Dag Nasty, I assume you tried out for them way back in 80. <laughs> kind of. I mean, it wasn't really a tryout. What happened was Brian was going to re re I guess you could say reboot the band and yes. he didn't, one, he didn't have a bass player. And I think that he appreciated what I brought to the table kind of like, um, musically and, uh, biz, I guess like how I could help get more eyes and ears on the project. So yeah. I'm, I kind of have, I, I'm kind of a good hustler in a way, you know? So I think that that was kind of where, where it came from. So there really wasn't an audition. It was more like, Hey, do you want to do Dag Nasty? And I was like, yeah, sure. And when do you want to start? And he's like, well, let's move back to DC. We're both in California. Let's move back, back to DC and we'll start it in the new year. And so right then we actually started writing songs for wig out at Danko's like, right. As we was like, okay, cool. I learned the songs on can I say, and we started writing. That was it. That's cool. It's neat. Um, for you, Andy. So with the Ramones, uh, how did you first meet uh, Joey Ramone? And then you guys must have been very close. If you, you you clearly did a lot of work with him. And then the last part of the question would be, uh, they you guys were signed to a major label before the Ramones. And uh, my friend asked me to ask you, um, do you feel that you got your due as a punk rock leader when it's Ramones, 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 and you guys had a deal before them? Well, uh, I met Joey at the Coventry. He used to come see us play when we were, we were wearing leather jackets and sneakers and jeans. And he was wearing uh, 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 satin pants and, and uh, spandex platform shoes. He was, he was, he was a sight to behold. Let me tell you. Right. Wow. <laughs> and he, he, he used to hitchhike down Queens Boulevard to get to the Coventry. Um, and uh, so we were always friendly. And then around the eighties, I, um, when Dee Dee was, uh, starting to want to be a rapper and causing trouble. Mm -hmm. I was brought in to, to do some bass playing and, and help on the, on the songwriting. And then our, our relationships kind of blossomed more after that. Um, but as far as do, you know, what? I've, I've been able to, uh, I've, I've made, you know, if, if you look at my uh, resume on my, my website, I have like 200 credits on albums for. A you are a songwriting machine. I did see. Songwriting. Yeah. Uh, I, I play bass. I, I yeah. produce. Uh, you know, my reward, you know, is, is as, as I say, I've said a million times in interviews, every day you make music is a good day, you know? Oh, yeah. If you make, and every day you make music with other people, it's a better day. And if you go, yeah. other, if you can make music with other people on a stage, that's a great day. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I make music every day. I'm happy. Yeah. You know, my bills are paid. Um, you know, I, I, I license my music a lot. So, you know, I got 40, 50 licenses over my lifetime to movies, TV shows, commercials, blah, blah, blah. You know, I played in a dozen bands. I have a, a side project record coming out. We're doing the video on Friday. Uh, so it'll be out, you know, in a few weeks, you know, yeah. Yeah. It would have been, would have been nice to have been, um, uh, made more money to have, uh, yeah. gotten more recognition, but you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been in the Ramones for, for a million years. That was torture. That, that band. That yeah. Was, right. It was full of mentally ill people, you know, um, 
I, I, I'm not a, my life, I look back and I go, I'm pretty happy how things turn out. Yeah. I'm a musician. I'm not a, hit maker. I'm not a hit maker. I'm a working musician. That's what I do. Andy, can I ask you a question? That something? No, no, you cannot. Just, just one, one question. And yeah. do you think, or at least for me, I, I, I freakishly love what I do. Like freakishly love what I do. It's nuts. Um, if you haven't 14, met, if you haven't met him, but he is the the biggest ball of energy, Andy. Oh, <laughs> it's dude, ridiculous. I'm a, I'm a hyperactive poodle. But I guess my question to you is. Do you believe, like I believe, that the best song is still yet to be written by you? Like you still have one in you and you're going to wake up and pick up your guitar and be like, holy shit. And that like, I still believe that. Like, I still love writing songs and I still think that there's another one inside me that's going to be better than the one before and better than the one before. Is that are, are you do you follow that same um, thing? Yeah, I think songwriting is my greatest joy. I think. And, but I, I enjoy the process for everything. I enjoy writing a song, even though it takes a lot longer for me now, I enjoy making a record and, and the process for making a record right now for what we've done with dictators is so freaking slow trading for, you know, what would take 10 minutes in a recording studio. If every thing in the studio would take 10 minutes, it'll take a week or two to do the same thing by trading right. files and say, Oh, I don't know if that worked. Try this. Try. You know, it's, uh, but I enjoy the process. I enjoy writing lyrics. I enjoy rehearsing. I enjoy playing my instrument. I enjoy playing piano, which I don't even play in a band. I just like learning songs. Yeah. I like making, you know, I like making music. Yeah. And that, and that makes me happy. So how yeah. come then did you, so you said that you would not want to do a, a compilation of the teenage wasteland gazette stuff. You would not want to put a book together <laughs> of all of it. Yeah. Why not? Why not? When you were talked into uh, revamping your group, what was the difference from that to this? Uh, it's a little, uh, it's a, you know, I was, I was a obnoxious teenager, wise guy, snot nosed, you know, good. Uh, <laughs> I went, I went, yeah, it is good. It is good. Fuck I have, yeah. I have, no, I have no regrets. I have no, no regrets. apologies. I just dude, don't no want it. You know, that's part of my life. It's, it's, it's there. There are some copies out there. People sell on the internet, but I, I, you know, the, and I wouldn't be making money from these, uh, these people offering the comps who want to come compile it. See, I'm a big design. I'm a big design collector. I don't want to put my time into it, you know. And I'm yeah. flattered. I'm flattered. People are some people are interested, but it's just not. I don't. It's not something I'm interested in doing right now. You know. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so, uh, when when the Joey Ramone albums were released, did you find it bittersweet? Oh, yeah. um, totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Oh, did, Andy, did you play on It's a Wonderful World, that, that one that he did? Yeah, I played bass and I sang on it, yeah. That's Ooh. a great song. That's, That's that, that might be Joe, that yeah. might yeah. be Ramon's best vocal. I fucking love That's it. That's an dude. amazing song, I know. It is I great. fucking love it. I love yeah. it. I love Louis' version. I love his version. Like, I know. Holy shit. He did a great I mean, it, Well, Louis was uh, posthumous too, wasn't it? Hmm, I don't know about that. I don't know. I, I mean, the thing the is, like, the thing is, is I guess with, for me with the Ramones, like to nerd out for a second, like I, I was well aware of the, the Ramones as a, as a teeny bopper. And I always recognized the pop potential of what it was. And it wasn't until like many, many years later when I'm at the grocery store and I'll listen on the music on the grocery store, you go 30 years later, they're playing it. And it's still phenomenal pop music for that kind of, again, you know, kind of like garagey bubblegum. I don't know. We would call it punk, proto-punk, whatever pop songs, like just freaking phenomenal. And that's what well, now than they were then. <laughs> yeah. 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 I got to, I got to meet, three of them. I never met Tommy, but I got to meet Johnny who came to see me once and was a standoff guy. Didn't even say hello. It was like <laughs> more, he, he was more pissed off that um, 
the publicity person Ida Lang Sam had dragged him over there. <laughs> I think he was more mad, which was kind of funny. I got to meet Joey once at Coney Island High, and he was working in the, I don't know, the 90s, and he was working with this other band, and he was super sweetest guy in the world, very cool. I got to nerd out and talk to him. And then I got to meet Dee Dee one time in mm -hmm. a um through I can't say who, but through a situation where everybody was at like a pot dealer's apartment and he said he was going to go grab some weed for some people, but he took the money and never came back. So I only got to meet him once yeah. through a very funny like weed grab 300 bucks and vanish kind of thing. So there you go. There you go. That's my Ramon stuff. Yeah, ripped off by Joe, by Didi Ramon classic. Well, not me, but my buddy was, yeah. my buddy was trying yeah. to get weed and then Didi just vanished. I would money. have never let that happen. <laughs> yeah, Didi, Didi was a schizophrenic. I mean, yeah. a classic where literally one day he's your best friend and the next day he hates you and you know, right. and you can't figure out what happened. Right. That's 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 the story. And it, um, it happened with me. I have a lot of people. Right. Joey was an absolute sweetheart. Loved his fans. You know, I would walk. We would, I would walk down the street with him and somebody would talk. He, he'd be stopped by fans and he would talk to them for like a half hour. And we're supposed to go to a restaurant or something. And right. I'm like, you know, I, get, I would yep. get impatient. But Joey loved talk to his fans. And Johnny, Johnny was uh, he was a control freak, you know. Um, but <laughs> it never would have happened without Johnny as a general. No, he was the rudder for sure. He yeah. was the rudder. And, that kind and of his, his guitar style, you know, yeah. changed the changed rock and roll. So it took a while. But yeah. then Tommy, Tommy was the architect. Tommy saw the big picture. Tommy put it all, all the pieces together. So it was a unique band, you know. Yep. I saw I did I saw an interview with Joey and he was saying how he would he'd piss in a cup and give it to somebody to drink and stuff. Do you think he would really do crap like that? They did that. Yes, they did that in England uh, when they played July 4th, 1970, 1976. Uh, yeah. At that the Roundhouse, uh, John, uh, Johnny Rotten came to see them and they, they pissed. In, in the beer and they gave it to Johnny Rotten and, and he drank that he drank it. So that's true. There that you go. That, the that's yeah. the Holy grail right there. Yeah. Is there any other <laughs> punk stuff that either one of you guys have from the old school punk stories that are just total bullshit. That's just like, I don't know why they say that's not true. Not true. Uh, yeah, no, I'd have to be Nothing. the story, you know, speaking of which, what, a, what a wonderful world was released when he was alive. So that's not true. <laughs> I just quickly no, no, no. looked it up. So no, no, he was dead. No, 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 no. He had died. No, he died. no. The Louis Armstrong version. I'm like, it was, oh, yeah. I see. Louis, okay, you're right. I was totally wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, for, for Doug, so Doug, you were, you were working with a band called the humble gods. So in my college sure. dorm room, I had a poster up of the humble gods that was my college room and then uh the humble gods sort of transitioned into the cottonmouth kings i remember mm -hmm. i remember it happening where all of a mm -hmm. sudden these two rap guys uh mm -hmm. start really just taking over the whole vibe of it all and then brad mm -hmm. who i didn't know you knew for that long you've known brad mm -hmm. for i had no forever idea. forever i didn't forever. know that so brad starts going with the uh, vibe of the money i think but that brad was a killer front man man right killer so so here's the backstory on that one. And Andy, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the story too. So you'll kind of follow this. So I was playing in this kind of uh, Southern California punk band and the Southern California punk band was on Hollywood records and it was a band called humble gods. And, you know, we played fast songs and blah, 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 blah. The and opening so, band was ICP. Remember? Right. And, and we, we had gone out to go do what was the other way around. We had gone out mm -hmm. to do some shows with insane clown posse the ICP where that were rap guys. And while we were in, well, on that tour, Brad, who's the singer for humble gods, um, saw like he had this epiphany where he was, he saw kind of like where track acts were going. So you figure like what rappers were doing, how there was a certain niche that wasn't being tapped. And he came up with this idea of fusing, a little bit of punk, a little bit of skateboarding, a little bit of weed culture and Southern California culture into this gigantic club sound. And um, he had these two young guys, younger guys, like high school kids that used to come to our shows when we would play in Southern California. And he kind of cherry picked them and groomed them with the idea that he was going to be the manager, but they were kind of like, um, 
they were kind of like the Cheech and Chong weed beastie boys. Yeah. Well, well, as the project developed, um, one of the guys bailed and Brad ended up being the third rapper. And that's right. kind of the, the basic idea. And they had a very, very long um, trajectory, couple decades of selling, doing really well on record sales. They were on Capitol Records. I played on a bunch of those records. I think I probably did somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 or 50 co-writes with Suburban Noise. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how that came about was like from as Humble Gods was going down because we were getting dropped from Hollywood, Brad saw the potential of the ICP thing. And, and he, he didn't really like ICP kind of lean a little bit more toward that, like um, horror rap where it's like a stage show, carnival, carnival freak kind of thing. I yelling at you because they would do the soda pop and they'd spray it right. all over the place. And right. the motors would be like, what the fuck, man? And right. they put garbage bags up in this yeah. pathetic attempt to stop it. Yeah, it was, they were, I mean, they're still, uh, they're still alive and well, but I think yeah. Brad, didn't see that he was going to be able to sell the horror rap thing. So he stuck with what he knew, which was the surf skate snow weed culture of Southern California. And that's kind of so built a career they, writing about that. So when I had Dennis on here, Dennis McGivern, and he was uh, mm -hmm. teching for uh, Lou, I think he was, yeah, he was teching for Maybe, Lou. So yep. he, he, uh, I asked him like, how do you play the drums that fucking stoned? How? Cause I know, I know they were, they were, they were really stoned all the time. I don't know yeah. if Brad was, but uh, the yeah. other guys, yeah. were, he was, I don't yeah. know. But yeah. uh, how, how do you play that screwed up? Have, have you had shows well, like that, Andy or whatever, where you were like, God, how did I drink that much tonight? How am I going to get through this? Oh, well, I the suck. thing is, the thing is, is I, I can, I can thread the needle on two of those. One, um, Cottonmouth Kings, like they really did smoke from six in the morning until six in the morning. Like they smoked yeah. the whole time. In fact, when I would go on tour with them, I would come back from the tours with asthma because that's how much pot smoke was in the bus. So it's, it's kind of tough. Well, with Lou, Lou was playing to tracks. So for the most part, there's a lot of, it's like playing along to a record in a way where it's mm -hmm. like, if you flub, as long as you can catch where you are, you're not going to goof up too bad. So I think that's kind of how that worked where you just played a track. Amazing to me. I mean, I get it. It's part of you. You've played the bass for so long, whatever. But at the same time, I've seen some shows like we did a Papa Roach show with Guns N' Roses. They, they were playing on uh, Rock and Rio. And the fact he made it through, I thought uh, the Papa Roach singer guy, I thought it was amazing. Mm -hmm. He made it through because mm -hmm. he was puking the whole time. How do you puke yeah. and go back to finishing the set? I mean, he was just, he had been drinking so much. Jacoby, you do. That's his name, Jacoby. Yeah, you do. I mean, you know, there are times, I, I, with no disrespect to Johnny Thunders, I remember seeing Johnny Thunders play at the Whiskey Go Go, and I was I was probably about sixteen or so, and um, he was definitely it was hard for him to stand up, and some people party very hard. I remember doing a, I remember doing a show with Sublime once, and similar. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go all the way back to the wrestling. He literally had to be carried off like he was like a wrestler. Like he had to be carried out off the stage. I, I couldn't I, I was so like Bradley, how how the fuck were you standing 10 minutes ago? Like I couldn't even believe he was able to stand. That's but amazing. Amazing. You know I were you a big partier Andy or were you a good boy or a bit no, of both or no, I never liked that I was not into drugs. Johnny Thunders people used to go see him because they thought this might be the last show. We want to see him die on stage. Sure. That was sure. part of it. Actually I went to elementary school with Johnny Thunders. I knew him wow. when he was like eight years old. Wow. I mean incredible. <laughs> so was he doing style, crazy stuff on a skateboard or no pre-skateboards? We, we he was a baseball player and a stickball player. In, in the schoolyard, he was an, a right. an athlete, an actual, yeah, you know, pretty good athlete, yeah, and a, and a and a pretty good writer, a pretty good songwriter, a great okay, performer, yeah. great and great the, fashion sense in a way, like kind oh, of how, how he wanted totally, to dress and like fucking badass. Totally had more charisma than Johnny Thunder. Totally, that guy dominated the room. Always looked great. Always yep. looked cool. He could put on any any kind of clothing, and he looked cool. Yep. Yeah. Star quality for sure. Star oh, quality. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Just beautiful. Like be great star quality, like a freaking 56 Cadillac, just star quality. You go, yep, that guy's got well, it. I never, never got into draw. I tried everything. Yeah. I like weed. I like wine. You know, I'm not into, you know, when I do a show, I'll do have a beer before the show. After the right. show, I might smoke some weed. I might drink a little more, yeah. but I, I learned early on that, uh, 
if I'm smoking weed before I go to the stage, I'm yeah. gonna I, Doug's and, boring and, now. I don't think you've done anything. In well, shit. I mean, I mean, I, well, first off, I was always so worried about being the weakest link live that I would never mm-hmm. drink or do anything before. Like that's just like, like there's a gear. I remember me. you getting, I, I felt you were nervous always. It was true. I, I, I think I don't, not nervous, not nervous. Like, um, Oh my God, there's people like, here. You guys were about to go on and then you'd come and check on us to make sure we had the t-shirt set up and stuff. And I'm yeah. like, where does the producing stop? And you get to go perform. It, it doesn't stop. So, so for me, part of it is, I think that if people are going to plop down 10 bucks or whatever, you have to deliver the goods and that's always why I just never felt like it almost feel like I was stealing from people if I phoned it in. Uh, and then, and then once I got, had kids and stuff like that, then I just was like, I just felt like I would be a bad role model. So I just kind of stopped drinking. I just kind of, I, maybe I aged out of it. I just grew out of it. Are you jumping just, up and down on the stage? still when you play now with field, uh, are you jumping a, around a little bit, a little bit? Yeah. You're a, a pretty bit. active bass player. You cruise. Yeah, I was a cruiser for sure. Now, now I, I hold field day is a little bit different because I do a lot of the vocal duties too. Like Peter and I are kind of doing in a way like the clash where it's like, we're doing a lot of vocals. I'm doing a lot of vocals. So I don't really have, I'm, you know, I don't have that much time to do backflips and shit like that. I'm getting older. What, <laughs> well, what's, the, what's, what's, questioning, what, yeah. what's the, what's the thing Clint Eastwood says, know your age, like know your age. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, he's, kidding. Kidding. he's almost a hundred years old, man. He's in his, I think he's in. <laughs> he's killing it. Yeah. He still directs movies. Clint. God yeah. bless. Go yeah. for it, dude. Yeah, All right. So quick, quick, so maybe final question, unless you guys have anything else you want to throw in, welcome to go for whatever. But, um, my, I was going to put a podcast together and my friend's fifth grade daughter and her girlfriends, they said, you need to ask the people when they first felt famous. So this is from a little kid. This is from a fifth grader. Mm. I've liked the question. Cause it has a broader perspective. When did you first feel good about yourself? When did you smile ear to ear? When did you maybe feel famous? When did you feel a celebrity? When did you know there was an event happening that you looked at yourself or someone else and thought, this is, this is, this is cool. What's the first that comes to mind? Andy. I don't particularly feel famous. I walk down the street. Nobody recognizes me. Um, I live my life in obscurity to some degree. I'll do zoom interviews once a week. I'll, uh, answer fan mail. Right. Um, I'll get on stage. I'll, I'll be a star when I'm on stage and then I'm back to my normal life. And I, I, I kind of like it that way personally. Yeah. And, and for me, I would say, um, I'm definitely wouldn't consider myself to be famous at all. Um, I just play music and some people like the music and the only time I don't know about an ear to ear grin, but the only time it catches me off guard is when I'm with my family and somebody will want to take a picture. And, um, uh, it, it requires me to, you know, my kids, you know, when I'm in my dad world, you know, I don't really think somebody's going to be like, dude, can I get a picture? You know? So, but every once in a while that happens. And, and I wouldn't say that that, uh, makes me feel famous as much as it requires a little bit more explaining to the kids. Like, you know, dad, do you know that guy or why is he coming mm-hmm. over? You know? So I get, I get kind of mm-hmm. cornered now and again, like that happens that there you go. Fame, fame can screw your head up. And I've seen it Many, many, many times. So I think if you got your feet on the ground and you consider yourself, I'm, I'm a working musician. Yep. That's what I do. Yep. I'm not. I'm not trying to be famous for famous yep. sake. Now, if if I write a hit song and I'm famous for that, I'm happy to to accept the fame. But yeah. uh, I don't want to be famous just for. I don't know. I don't know for whatever. Yeah, I, I, I kind of it's it's wild because when we do field day shows, I. I build in a meet and greet after the show. So we play for about an hour and then we, and then we're done. And, and then we tell everybody like, Hey, we're going to get some, you know, get some water. We're going to hang out. And usually there's a, a fair amount of people that want us to sign stuff. They want to take pictures. Blah, 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 blah. And and I you still sell that record, right. so, you sell vinyl there. You can, yep. you know, it's so, that's a way, an absolutely perfect way to, to connect with your fans. I think it's, a, yeah. Totally and, and, and I kind of look at it more like, um, you know, wow, they plop down whatever 10 bucks to come see us on a Saturday night. I think it's proper manners to say hello. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of, I come from a totally like in the punk world, there's not a lot of 
separation between the fans and the, and, and the band and um, people I, I'm, I'm probably one of the most approachable guys in the world after the show, like come find me, I'll come say hi, I'll take pictures. And just, it is, I feel kind of a, in, in a way, a bit of an obligation as a, as a, um, maybe a thank you for checking it out. And there's a lot of options out there. And thanks for coming and seeing me on a Saturday night. Yeah. I had Peter Feinstone on here and uh, I posted it to a bad religion room and a fan wrote, man, I would kill to have a record signed by you. And I don't know. One of the other guys, probably Greg, mm-hmm. but anyway, he's gonna mail it to me, man. Yeah. <laughs> he, he yeah. was like, send it all, I'll sign it and send it back. That was really cool. He's a great guy. But very yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's the, that's the thing where it's like within, in the punk world, like after kiss, you know, where, where kiss had that more kind of like the mystery and you never saw behind the curtain kind of thing. Um, I, I grew up playing in sh- shitty bars and juke joints and VFW halls. And there was no, there's no green room. There's no separation. <laughs> there's no separation. You're like, Hey, I'll be right back. I got to go play. And you just went and played. <laughs> it was just yeah. like that. Yeah. And then you, you came like back. Piss, you go in the same bathroom as the audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's the, there's no separation. And you, and you just, I mean, it's, it wouldn't be a surprise. Like I, I guess some fans out there would know, like I was such a, I still am kind of a, a bit of a character, but I would go into remote, you know, you go, you're in Columbus, Ohio or some crazy town and a, a kid would be like, Holy shit, a joy division shirt. And you go, wow, you like it. And they're like, yeah, I would literally take it off and go, I'm sorry, it's wet and hand kids my clothes. Cause I just, huh. just like, whatever. Like, you know, I kind of felt like because I was able to go to all these other cities, I maybe in a way tried to be an ambassador of goodwill, you know, because that was before hot topics and malls and all that other stuff. So I was always very open to hanging out with the fans. Oh, you easy. were, I was, I was 16 years old and yeah. you were super easy to talk yeah. to. And it was great. Doug would give us a beer. I don't know. We probably shouldn't say yeah. that. That's probably bad. Right. I don't know. He'd give us a beer, but he, yeah. I know. And then, then there was girls that went to the shows and all we had to do was sell t-shirts and we could come, you know, go put this <laughs> flyer up outside. I'm like, I'm in, I'm a big, yeah. I'm a easy. big zine collector. I love Raymond Pettibone stuff. And as I started getting into it, I called Doug and it was, uh, I forgot, but it was, it was a, it was a poster and he goes, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That one's real. That one's real. I remember having that one. Man. We did the show with those guys and, and it was so fun yeah. to get it back into the vibe and all that early yeah. punk art. I love, yes. love, love, love. For so. sure. So Andy, I have one question for you. Um, if you don't mind, wh- whose idea was it to do the false stop ending uh, at the end of, I guess, faster and uh, faster and louder on, um, Blood Brothers. Was that your idea to do the stop, fake it, and then the stop? Idea that was. I don't remember. So f- genius. That song's yeah. badass. I love the kind of cl- I love the rolls, like the yeah. the the crescendos inside the song. Great. Bruce Springsteen, you know Bruce Springsteen's on that song. I did not know that. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, we that's amazing. That. He was in the studio next door, and we had him count off. At we do it that big, 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 big bill. He does the one, two, three, four. Yeah, he that's him. Yeah, yeah, Shit. that's amazing. It that's is amazing. It is. Yeah, really that's good. badass. Yeah. yeah, I was listening to Blood Brothers today and I was like, oh, you know, great. Uh, you know, just great, you know, just like to- just a different world of writing and you know, phenomenal playing and writing. And really, I really appreciated the arrangement on that one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really loved the false stop at the end, like, oh, yeah. Thank you. Got me. <laughs> you know, there's this really good heart or feel good story is with Bruce Springsteen and, uh, and then one of those early tracks one where the, the guy could throw the baseball in high school or whatever. Well, the guy yeah. would always say, yeah, that's me. That's me. That's me. And his wife got a hold of Bruce Springsteen and they hung out, they went to a diner together and they caught up yeah. and he's like, you know, you, you, it is true. You were, you are the, you were the guy it's, it's true. <laughs> yeah. And I love such a great article. It was so, so neat to read, you know, what a down to earth, good guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This, I mean, the guy, story's got to come guy who spent a lot of time talking to fans. I haven't, I haven't seen Bruce in a long time, but uh, he's a guy who will talk to fans for half an hour after the show. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. um, that, that's course is 23 years ago, but mm-hmm. uh, he, he's another you know, kind of down to earth. Mm-hmm. 
guy doesn't look look at himself as being a famous person. He looks at himself as being a, a musician and a songwriter yeah. and a band leader. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I think I think it comes down to appreciation. You feel lucky when you can pay your bills doing what you like, especially after decades. It's neat, and then to yeah. get to. Uh, to, to, to work again with people that you worked with in your youth. I love the idea of, I, I like the fact that you can still stick together, both of you guys and do new things with people that from the old school and do what you like doing. So, uh, you know, having listened to a bit of both, I appreciate listening to your guys's new music and your old music. So, oh, great. Thank yeah. you. Hey Doug, you come in East coast, uh, on your, uh, on your always, tour? always. So yeah. how, I don't know. I don't know how far upstate you are, but we're going to be, um, and we're going to be uh, closer to like Manhattan doing like, you know, Baltimore, Philly, blah, 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 blah. But I'm supposed to get up into your way in the spring, um, up by, uh, you know, up by towards like the Albany's Buffalo's that kind of area after the snow. Cause I I'm from Southern California. I don't do all that snow shit. <laughs> so I got to wait a little bit, but if you, if you're anywhere close and you could give me the two things, anytime you have any questions, if you ever want to, talk shop and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I'm happy to whatever. If you want to talk shop, we can always talk shop. Joel's got all my contacts. Reach out. Don't be a stranger. Yeah. And then vice versa. Albany, I'm, I'm, I'm close to Albany. Albany was about a 45 cool. minutes. Away, so right. I, I so, play there. I'd love to come see you. Yeah. 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 And we'll come on out and hang and we'll do, we'll do the do for sure. We'll, we'll hang out and whatever. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I think we might play lost horizon might be where we go. I'm not sure if I know that, but, uh, whatever, a rock yeah. bar, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> they're, the, they're the same. There's the thing. There's the shitty bathroom. Yeah. There's the bar. <laughs> it kind of smells like stale beer. You, I mean, come on, dude. It's the, it's the same. You're not missing much. And if you get to freaking Southern California with dictators, like reach out, like come let's hang, like reach out and tell me I'll, I'll come out or whatever. Well, we, uh, I, uh, hey, Joel, could you send, yeah. do want you to do an email? Sure. Yeah. I have his email. He's got my email. Yeah. Cause you have yeah. all the info. Yeah, for that sure. And, for sure. And Andy, if you like, I, I know you're dealing with all the agent stuff, you know, if, if you need, if you want some brotherly, you know, advice or whatever, you want to chat and talk shop, don't be a stranger, dude. Like, hey, like hey. I, I'm knee deep in it right now. I'm knee deep in it. So give me a buzz. If I, if I'm happy yeah. to share a contact I or something like that. that. Yeah. I, I, I'm from the old school of like, I don't need all the pie. I just try to help my friends and keep the, keep music going. So that's kind of where my head is. You know, one of the things I remember from the first time you sat me down and explained to me stuff was, and I don't know why I, I pulled it out, but it was uh, how Ian McKay would do everything off of a handshake. Mm-hmm. And that guy never sure. missed sending me my five cents on a song or whatever it ended up, but it was sure. always done on a handshake. And I loved that. With most sure. of the music people I've met where you could still do it on a handshake, they would never do anything, yeah. the rules or whatever. It wasn't the legality crap of the corporation stuff now. Sure. No. Y- yeah. There's stood out to me. Like there's definitely something to be said about um, when you have a long career in, in the music world, they see you going up and they see you coming back down. And if you've never burned bridges or you've, you've done more goodwill than, being a vampire and a horrible person that lasts for a long time. In fact, uh, one silly story and I'll, we'll wrap it. No. The, I, the, I'm getting ready to play Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And the guy at the HMAC, Jeremy, I gave him his first freaking show when he was 15 no, neat. for his first show. And he's, he's, he's like, holy shit. Like, what, were you out of your mind booking a show with me? I'm like, no, you were the, like, you sounded like you had your shit together. You were the kid on the ground. Let's go. And I kid you not, like a bazillion years later, he still does shows. I'm doing a show with him. And I was the first, Jack Nasty was the first show he ever did. Weird. Like, true. That's great. P- people stay in the business for a reason. They love music. Cause everybody's cool. You know, that's a, who's an asshole. There's not that many assholes. Most people are right. It's not that bad. <laughs> not yeah, that assholes bad. get kicked out of the business and people don't work with them. That's right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the ones that last, like usually the jerk offs go pretty quick. It's the ones that are yeah. still in it. They're pretty cool. They're approachable. You know, they do good business, you know, good business. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. If you're ripping people off, 
people yeah. are going to want to work with you. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't yeah. last very long or you got to be looking over your shoulder or all that other bullshit. It's like that, that stuff catches up with you, man. It's just, it's just bad. It's just bad. I don't do bad business. <laughs> I don't burn bridges. I don't do bad business. It's just bad. I'm planning on being here for a while. So yeah. there's no, it's like, why would I want to create a freaking hornet's nest of trouble? Fuck that. <laughs> Here's a fun one. I don't know if you'll have, but, uh, what bands do people expect you guys not to like that you absolutely had all their records? Andy. Uh, I had some great answers out of this one from people. <laughs> I don't know. Beach boys are like my favorite band, you know, my first. Still, I love the beach boys. I still I love know. listening to pet sounds on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, what band do I like? It's hard. Oh man. I'm blanking out on that, but there are, there are definitely bands that I like. That right. People go, you like that? Yeah. yeah. Right. I'll, I'll lean in on that one and say, yeah. I'll, I'll nudge you a little, Andy. Maybe you'll, yeah. I can appreciate great songs. And although I come from the punk world and, you know, I'm in garage land or whatever, like I would bet people don't know that I uh, would like ABBA or the Bee Gees or oh. funk, like the OJs, like a lot of funk and you know, stuff. You know what I mean? Just stuff where I'm like, you know, I, I guess it's, it's, I, I can just appreciate good songs regardless yeah. of genre, you know, sure. regardless of genre, I, I love here. a well-crafted song. And so I'm going to, I'm going to go with, I bet people don't know how much I could appreciate a well-crafted Bee Gees song. So the Bee Gees, early Bee Gees, early Bee Gees in particular, you know, I think Fuck. amazing. They I just did this documentary. It's a classic. Abba, well, again, Abba is, you know, I love Abba. Great, great, great tunes. So yeah. I'm uh, with you it's there. Good songwriting. Good, just good songwriting. I like good songwriting. But they just released this Bee Gees documentary that you guys should check out. There wasn't too much new information from it, but it was quite it. well done. And wasn't it nice? I saw it. Basically, he just wants to be remembered as a songwriter. That was what was most important to him out of all of the crap. And yep. uh, I love the reinventing because it's so hard to do. Um, oh, yeah. And oh, then yeah. at the end of it all, those songs, those songs are so, so good. They're iconic. I mean, though they're not iconic. They'll stand the test of time. Just freaking phenomenal writing. I saw that documentary and I was blown away. I guess Enjoy they it. were, they were writing a record. They were in France and they were writing a record in the South of France at some shitty studio. And, and Stigwood had asked him to write some songs for Saturday night fever. And that kind of like rebooted it. But the great part about the Bee Gees yeah. is um, it shows similar to, and I've talked about this before, Tony Bennett, when you're in music, it's a, it's a long arc. And there are times you're up, times you're down, times you're really up, times you're down, down. And it's like, you have to just kind of stick with it. And, and that's a great, if you watch the documentary, you can see the arc of the Bee Gees where it's like, there were times where they were killing it. And there were times where they were hated public enemy. Number hated. one, hated. amazing amazing and you're you hated gotta, for like the biggest song of all time basically i mean what the heck is going on here there's no rhyme or reason to it i think times change and people need to have an enemy and sometimes you end up on the wrong side of sometimes you're the nail sometimes you're the hammer i don't know brother right. i don't know but but either way freaking badass songwriting phenomenal oh, love it and again i'm the early stuff too i started a joke oh god it's so yeah. good Phenomenal. That's yeah, a simple harmonizing. I love it. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you so much. I appreciate you spending your afternoon with me. And For uh, sure. I'll yeah. definitely search, I'll shoot you guys an email now and uh, I'll put your info or you respond, whatever you guys want, but I'll put you in touch. Hey, thanks for watching Party Like a Rockstar. If you're not already subscribed to the Facebook or YouTube channels, do it. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. The handle is Party of Stars. Thanks for watching. You'll see you next time.